Hey everybody, Jay Widener here. Uh, thanks for watching Reality Check. Um, please subscribe and all that other stuff. And I have a newsletter at jaywidener.com. So if you want to sign up for my new newsletter, just go to jaywidener.com and put your name on the list and I'll get you going on it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of stuff going on, as you guys know. And uh, one day I'll address it, but I just don't feel like talking about it anymore for a while. Um, so let's just get right to what we're doing here. And that is, we're talking to Randy Kramer. Randy Kramer is one of my favorite people. He served in the, he's the real deal. He's, you know, he was taken by at an early age uh, and put in, actually, what am I doing this for? You should be doing this, Randy. How you doing, Randy? I'm doing fabulous, Jay. How you doing? Great. So Randy, just, yeah, I want, I want to hear your story. So. I mean, I've heard it before, but it's worth repeating because it's so fascinating. And then we'll get into some of the stuff that's about to happen. But first, I want, want you to tell, like, what, when did this happen to you? When, when was the first, how old were you when the first thing that happened to you happened to you? Um, that would actually have been before I was born uh, because I was genetically engineered from the ground up to do my job. Uh, I was not augmented at a later time. I was not taken as a child or as a young adult and then done some sort of gene therapy or something, which is older tech. It's a way to augment people genetically, but it's an older way of doing things. Uh, the program that I was created under was under the auspice that if you really want to do it right, you start from the very, very ground up, which means you not even before they're babies, but well, before they're babies, when they're actually you're doing the DNA encoding from the very, very restart. So that is where my story begins there. In a laboratory being genetically engineered and augmented using some ET DNA with 299 other uh, DNA pairs that were being created for the program, which I was uh, trained under called Project Moonshadow. That was a tons of training from, you know, sort of adolescent, preteen, teen years, was deployed at 17 years old for a 30-year tour in covert military space program activities were served a good chunk of that in the MDF, which is the Mars Defense Force on the ground, uh, and also spent time as a pilot, uh, sort of doing general solar system defense and some other stuff after that, actually working with a special forces unit, which is a whole other story that I won't get into it right now, but uh, yeah, and then it was returned, uh, which is the fun part, uh, age reversed, which is what they call it, and mind suppressed, and then they return you 15 minutes after you leave, so you wake up thinking, wow, what a long dream I had, and that's really a messed up inside, but I don't know why, and then I spent decades sorting that out, got total recall a while back, and have been talking about this as PR guy for the United States Command Staff of the United States Marine Corps Special Section, which is specific. I'm not a whistleblower. I am not doing this without uh, permission from anybody. My superiors came to me and said, would you like to do this job? And I said, no, I have no desire to do this job <laughs> whatsoever. You got to be kidding me. I do not want this job. And my brigadier, mm, let's say we talked about it over the period of a couple of weeks, and he was convincing at some point that this was better than what the alternatives were. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll do that. Yeah. Why not? So, so that's just, why. The, so you were. That's, that's mission. Nutshell. In a nutshell, that's pretty fast. Yeah. I've, I've heard of the longer versions, but we're going to get into your story in, in, in more depth here. So. Oh, sure. <clears throat> so you've been sort of sanctioned by uh, command to be able oh, yeah, to. Absolutely. So you're like softening the ground. Is that what you're doing? Uh, um, um, for later display? So. So um, early discussions with my brigadier were often about how do I talk to people? Who am I talking to? What is really my audience of people who I'm addressing when I speak? And so I've said this before, and I will say it again, not to be rude to people in the general public, but my, it's not my job to talk to the general public. So the general public just happens to be listening because I do my conversing over an open system of interviews so that anybody who wanted to find out what's the latest thing that I said can do a search and find it and listen to it so that the information that I'm providing is accessible, easily accessible to elected officials, military intelligence personnel, um, 
emergency services personnel and anybody who is in a need to know that shit's happening, shit's changing, and either you're on the watch and you're paying attention so you're ready for how it's all gonna go down to do your job right, or you're not, you're gonna screw up. So it, those are the people that I've always been addressing and talking to. And I happen to just be talking to everybody else at the same time because you're all happen to be listening because it's completely public form when I make my whatever I'm going to say. So my job as the PR guy is to simplify the things that are people need to know, uh, really just not bother talking about things people don't need to know. And I will totally admit this, which is do my best to try and explain why there's positive spin to what's happening in the world and how we've had to go through this process to get to the disclosure window that we're coming into now, how it's going to roll out, why it's not going to be the prettiest picture in the world, but that's just the way it's going to happen. We just have to get over uh, any notion that we want it to be the way we want it to be, because that's not the way it's going to be, but it is going to happen uh, in a way that changes the whole world and people just need to fucking get on board. Let me just be honest. So that's my job. That. Uh, but yeah, not that's quite my job. <clears throat> because I want to make sure people understand who you are, uh, uh, what your background is before we release that incredible information. So <clears throat> you said that you served on Mars? Uh, for 17 years uh, and some odd months and days in the Mars Defense Force, the MDF, yes. And uh, what, what did you do? What was your like? Uh, mostly infantry, uh, specialized infantry. So basically, we were given a powered body armor, uh, Gauss rifle, magnetically propelled rifle uh, to patrol and protect a territorial zone around the colonies. That's the mission statement. What we really were doing was skirmishing with indigenous reptoids and in insectoids in order to perfect and uh, develop military hardware. So uh, there was a later point in my career when we used uh, body armor that was just head and shoulders and decades beyond more advanced than what we were using in the MDF. So we, I would have thought at that time that, oh, this is really cool, pretty advanced stuff. And then getting a, a more specialized job where you're giving a higher quality piece of equipment, realizing, oh, okay, Re that really is just testing lower level equipment that we make and sell to other people and how to perfect right. that and, you know, desert environments, sandy, dusty environments. Right. Uh, it's a perfect place to do that. Mm -hmm. So it was really a, a hardware testing zone, but it was a constant, um, like, anywhere from two to three combat events a week that would involve in, you know, injuries and fatalities. And uh, so in a way you're saying it was like a research and development for technology. Pretty much. Yeah. For military hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah we had a lot of, we had a lot of like reissues, you know, we had a lot of <clears throat> new equipment that would come in. Oh, you're getting reissued this. We test it out. Eh, that doesn't work so great. Great. We go back to something else or get reissued something else. So we were, you know, constantly going through upgrades and changes in the equipment. So looking back on it, it, it seems much more clear that it was a testing zone. But at the time, you just believe what you're told, which is you're protecting the colonies. Here's the latest we have. Get out there and do your job, soldier. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, um, there's a, a writer. Um, he's a professor at some university. His name is David Jacobs. And he's written these books about... Um, uh, hybrids taking over the earth, um, the right, and he says that the at the very center of this operation, if it's true, is the insectoids. Would you buy that? No. No. Good. No. Um, so there are uh, indigenous insectoids on Mars, for example. We have indigenous insectoids here on planet Earth. Oh, really? Um, Oh, yeah. No, the Hopi uh, talk about being taken underground by the ant people and brought back out at some point. Yeah, that's totally. We have indigenous insectoids. They live underground. They have no reason to want to come up to the surface and hang out with us at all. Yeah. Um, they're completely content to be subterranean dwellers, like plenty of the people who live underneath the surface of the earth. Yeah. Uh, and they're just not in their nature to be like, let's make a hybrid clone species to rule the world. That's just so against their social psychological model that I would say no. 
Yeah, it seems so far. Not to say, not to say, yeah, not to say that there could not be an insectoid species with a conquering mindset that could happen. Uh, it would just not be typical for evolved insectoid species. But we know in the universe that there's typical and atypical all the time. So, you know, it could happen, but no, not the terrestrial variety for sure. Not the kind who live here. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> <clears throat> were the insectoids highly intelligent or what was their highly intelligent highly intelligent uh fully psionically capable as far as telepathic communication is concerned uh the hive consciousness very developed so they're very organized they're busy all the time building things genetically engineering other biological organisms to do jobs within uh the hive structure yeah they were you know busy and industrious all the time doing whatever they were doing. I'm sure that what we experienced near the sort of surface of the hive is not as big as what was happening below the surface. Right. And this colony you worked at, um, was it big, large colony? Or? Well, it, it was a, no, no, we didn't work at the colonies. We were outside the colonies. I was at a place called Forward Station Zebra. It's a military base. Uh, the colonies were, we never got to visit the colonies. We were told they were somewhere uh -huh a good distance behind our rear lines and that our job was just to maintain, you know, our front. So that was the grid map that we got to look at every day. Wow. That's really interesting that you didn't get to visit the colonies. That's sort of No, cool. not at all. No, we're completely isolated from them. In fact, completely isolated. With the exception of sometimes um yes and no i mean you just sort of buy the uh it's to keep you know contamination out or something uh, like that it's which you know you just sort of accept that um the exception of the rule is that the sort of capital of the colony which is also military headquarters which is aries primus military personnel do go in and out of there on a regular basis and i've been in and out of there like three or four times in my entire career um, but for the most part, the other colonies, no, no visit, no day passes, no weekend liberties, not an option. We have no idea what's going on there other than what people tell you. Were there uh, any women in your group or was it just men? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It was about somewhere between a two thirds male to a third female soldiers. So yeah. That's cool. And um, you've also been to the moon, to the lunar base. Sure. Yeah, Lunar Operations Command, been there. So it's very Big. interesting. Um, so what was like the, what's the coolest thing about your experience in, the, in this uh, secret space program? What was it like the coolest thing that you were involved in? Oh, I probably still has to be. So after I did my 17 years in the MDF, I got a promotion. I got to go to flight school. I got to be a pilot which is really like childhood dream but pilot spacecraft i'm there um so i did that for a number of years after that and one of the coolest jobs i ever had was when i was stationed on the nautilus and every once in a while they would have uh, guys from the diplomatic corps who would come onto the nautilus uh before they would set off onto meetings uh, missions at the intergalactic space station which orbits around jupiter um i would occasionally get asked to come along because I was the only deck officer with infantry and hand-to-hand -hand experience and we're monkeys and we love to have a just-in-case guy so I was the just-in-case guy but I never it was never like that it was just the most calm you know no, nobody pulling knives on each other kind of environment I was never needed to be there for why I was there so it was really just a luxury that I got to sit in on these meetings when I got to tag along uh, because they were just the most fascinating interactions with other species that, you know, we could have ever asked for just as a, oh, hey, would you like to sit at a table and have some conversations with some other species you know, every once in a while? Would you like that? Yeah, okay, that sounds pretty cool. So it just has to stand out as some of the more amazingly awesome and cool experiences I've ever had, for sure. For sure. How many, uh, how many alien species did you actually see? Different one. Uh, well, you sit down at a table with, you know, almost a few dozen, but this is a room that's like almost a mile in diameter, and there's off, always people in filling up the entire room or most of the room at, at what we call conversational environments, which could be a table, could be a table next to a tank, 
could be a tank next to a tank. They're hard light holograms that can sort of come on and go off uh, instantaneously to adapt the environment to any size uh, or um, environmentally required species. So you can have a very small species having a conversation with a very large species at, at eye level because there's a conversational environment that allows that. So they're in, seen with my eyes, hundreds, hundreds of species in that room over a period of like dozens of visits, but uh, sat at a table with probably, yeah, 30, you know, almost three dozen. I'd have to really stop and think about it, but it was, you know, a good number. And um, <clears throat> so do you agree with like uh, this idea that we achieved zero or um, zero G sometime in the fifties and that was the beginning? of the secret creation of the secret space program sometime like in maybe the mid fifties? Well, I think that the earliest stages of development of the technology go back to world war two. Right. And it's hard to say, depending on who you listen to tell you at, you know, who had what first, who had the first spaceship they could get back and forth to the moon, who had the first, you know, spaceship they could get back and forth to Mars, who had the first spaceship they could get, you know, to the end of the solar system and back. This was all very early development tech that happened in the 40s and the 50s. Um, so depending on who you listen to and who tells you what they think the history lesson of which was first, which program is first, keeping in mind that it's a secretive system that as programs concluded themselves, often the most pertinent information was locked away in a very tight space and all the other files regarding the personnel, the project itself, the process that was accomplished in order to achieve the project were shredded and made to disappear. So um, this has been a process which isn't just, let, hey, let's keep it secret and then keep the secrets in a file cabinet over here somewhere so that someday we can all get back into it and remember what the history of all this secret stuff was, where a ton of what happened was literally it happened, we learned something from it, and then we shredded every piece of evidence that we con concluded or conducted the study in any way, shape, or form, and the research in any way, shape, or form. So we're just on to the next thing, on to the next thing, while sort of burning the past uh, intelligence process of it. So you don't really have a good history lesson uh, to go by. It's kind of rough. But I would, I would say it started, you know, World War II, post-World War II, when we seriously started to crack, how do we build these things? How do we build a, you know, our own EG drives and our own magneto drives? How do we take a damaged craft and make it functional again? You know, how can we build our model? Uh, I mean, we certainly, you know, we're on the moon uh, by the early 1950s that, you know, we were able to take, you know, a ship, get it there, get a couple of guys, walk them off, you know, in environment suits and walk them back on and say, yay, we made it to the moon. That was early 50s. So about the time that uh, Werner von Braun and Walt Disney started getting in on the idea of this moon base and the space station, they were super psyched about it. That was because they were hearing you know, from all of their insider people. No, no, we're there. We're doing it. We're going to make it happen. We're going to do this moon base, you know, everything. Let's just talk about it, get public support behind it. Let's do it. That was mid fifties. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what the, uh, a NASA insider about 20 years told me that it was moon was in the early fifties and then Mars was in the early sixties. Yep. Early sixties, about 63, 62, depending on yeah, who you believe. Yeah, and that's a, a great explanation of why we don't know the details because they're destroying the intelligence so that no one can ever even figure it out. And that'd be exactly yeah. what they would do. That's exactly what they would do. Yeah. So that when it all comes out anyway, they don't want a lot of people spending a lot of time talking about the last 70 or so years. They want right. people to just start talking about where we are now and what's happening in the future and let's ignore the last 70 years of how we got here. As much as they can do that, they'll be happy, yeah. That is absolutely the best explanation I've heard ever. Uh, one last thing before we get on to the important stuff. You said you were age regressed. What, uh, what, what, could you explain that? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, totally. It's, it's not a, I don't think it's an accurate description of the uh, process to begin with. So they, what they call age reversing and a mind wipe or a memory wipe is neither. So age reversing is actually cracking out a fresh clone that's the age that you were when you were deployed. So in my case, it's a 17-year-old clone of myself. 
and then transferring the consciousness, the literal soul and spirit of, that is within me that is a quantum fluid dynamic that can be removed from this vessel, put into a temporary containment unit, and then put into another vessel. And if it's, especially if it's my own body, uh, there will be no rejection of my being and another copy of myself. I will just, you know, come into awakening conscious state and going, oh, I'm in myself again and accept that. If I was put into a different person or something, I might have a freak out and be like, what am I doing in this other body? But because it was my own body, um, it was no big deal. So what they call age reversing is really not. It's really just making a new version of you and then putting you inside it. Basically making you a new car that's younger than the car that you're driving right now, but it's the exact same model. And then you just get out of one car and you get in the other car. That's really what happens. And the mind wipe is also not a mind wipe. It's a repression. It's a memory repression because you can't wipe people's memories without deleting their entire brain banks. So anytime you're doing a quote unquote mind wipe, what you're really doing is just repressing the memories to come out later. And yeah, and then they always come back eventually. Always, always. Yeah. Always. And uh, no matter yeah, they, want, they want to find a way. They want to find a way. Your brain wants to find a way to wholeness and it will find a way to yeah. do it whether you want it to or not and whether you cooperate with it or not. That's right. It's, it's, all, it's inevitable. And it doesn't matter if you're in the secret space program or just part of a, a MK Ultra program here on Earth. Uh, yeah. Your memories will come back, usually around 40, 40 years old is when everything yeah. starts coming back. I have seen it as young as 19 or 20, and I have seen it as late as late 40s, almost early 50s. So I've seen quite a range. I'd say you're right that the peak is sort of between 30 and 40, uh, but it is a pretty wide range of when people start to actually get their memories back. Now. I'm, see I'm seeing a wide bracket. Actually, I'm going to take, take that back. In, in my observation, it's been women who get the memories in their 40s Men are all over the place now that I think about it. Yeah. I know people in their 60s were getting memories coming back now. Okay, wow, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's the best explanation, by the way, for age regression. It makes total sense. It's scientifically yeah. valid. Your body's not going to reject anything because no. it's you. And, um, and you, you come back, you think you don't, you, you, your memories are suppressed, so you can't remember what happened. So, I can specifically remember the exact morning when I woke up in my bed again and I sat up in bed and I had the sense that I had had a dream that was the longest dream I'd ever had. Like I was like, I'm sitting there in bed, sitting in front. Whoa, that was, let's, let me backtrack my brain process through that dream. Like I might do on any other waking moment having coming up from a very vivid dream and it was like wow that seemed like it was months and months and months and I was in the process of like seeing that saying that wow that was like months and months and then it was like oh there it goes it's gone and my alpha bridge closed and right. it was down in the subconscious and I was back in my conscious but I was in my bed I looked the same age I got up went to the bathroom looked in the mirror and I'm like oh okay I got school tomorrow and just accepted where I was and what I was doing and, and allowed all everything that was repressed to stay there. Because to be honest, look, there's a, a natural part of the human nature that when you decide, get to forget a bunch of things that are really just kind of fucked up, to be honest with you, there's a lot of violence and uh, crazy violence with you know other species in my career. And to be honest, I was fine to just not remember that or think about that or be able to pretend that I was deleting that and starting over. Like there's part of my personality that was just perfectly happy and okay with that. So there's not a resistance to accepting that you're back where you started from. You'd rather be there than, you know, in sort of the state of what the hell do I do with all of these memories of being somewhere in some place that I'm not allowed to talk about, even if I could remember them and who would believe me if I told them anyhow, and what do I do with that? Am I crazy? Have I lost my mind? Is it trauma related? The journey of having to, you know, talk to mental health professionals to realize that it no symptomatically it was post-traumatic stress disorder not any other personality disorder or anything else in the dsm-4 so i mean i had to go through the whole process trying to sort that shit out and you don't you don't want to you know what i'm saying when you get back you're just like oh i'm back where i am i'm in my young body again cool you're stoked with that you're just fine with that 
Yeah, I had a, 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 a person from the Secret Space program. He told me that when he came back, <clears throat> the only re only thing that he knew that he didn't have any memories uh, or anything, but he he re he realized that he was more mature at that right. point from that point yeah. on, and he couldn't figure out what had caused him to suddenly become more mature. So that, did you have that oh too? instant yeah instantaneously i was attracted to a circle of friends that were 10 to 15 years yeah. older than me uh did not want to hang around people my own age because they just kept going oh my god they're so immature um absolutely did that and um also uh, all of a sudden could remember how to do things how yes. to perform skills or functions that i don't remember or didn't remember being trained for or ever having done before uh and i would like Oh no, that you just turn that, you do this thing. And I'm like, wait, how did I know how to do that? Where, where did that come from? So that started happening. Yeah, those two things did happen almost immediately. Yeah, there's a other guy that, 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 I, that I talked to who said the same exact thing. You figure out how to fix the washing machine. He's like, how do I know how to fix the washing machine? How do I understand the mechanics? I've never even looked inside one. And he was like fixing everything around the house and his parents were really impressed because he knew how to do all this stuff. He'd never had any interest in it before, right? But after he came back, he was this different person, you know? Yeah, the, the biggest surprise and shock to me was um, like martial arts abilities that I didn't ever remember taking a class for. Um, and so, I mean, I had done some, I'd done a few years of Aikido, which is a certain type of, you know, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, discipline, but it's not like the other fighting disciplines that are, a lot more aggressive uh and i had a couple of really weird experiences where I was in a confrontation with someone and someone threw a punch and i did a bunch of things and then when it was over i was kind of like how did i do that when did i learn how to, what the fuck just happened and even having you know a friend there's like dude where'd you learn ninja skills and i mean like dude, i don't know it was it was just the most strange thing in fact it, it was terrifying to be honest with you, because I went into a mode where my body was doing things that I did not feel that my brain was behind the wheel of, and I felt that I could really hurt someone if I wasn't careful. So I was actually, it actually, it was like learning that I had a live gun in my belt at all times, and I was terrified I was going to shoot somebody in the face with it because I was really good somehow. I didn't understand how, but I was really good. Yeah, again, my other guy that I talked to, had, he said he had that same killer instinct when he came back, that he could, he could just, he was just a stone cold, could kill anybody he wanted. He had skills, he didn't know where they came from. And that's Yeah, amazing. first time I grabbed a guy by, who, a guy got confrontational, went to take a punch at me, and I swatted his arm away, reached in, grabbed him by the throat, and lifted him off of the ground with one hand. And, and, and he's, he, and he, choking him like cutting off his air supply sure. until he was like literally starting stop 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 and i dropped him on the ground and then just immediately left because i was like holy shit i almost killed that guy what the fuck yeah it was it was weird and shocking at first i had to like that i had to really figure some stuff out about what was happening inside my you know kinesthetic responses and my mind body discipline stuff but it only made me that much more dedicated to the yoga the qigong and the stuff that i was already doing yeah. to get more grounded more centered and very very clear on whatever the fuck was going on inside my brain because there was some shit going on there that i couldn't just you know say two plus two equals four to at all so when you when you got your memories back or you started to get them back, did you go confront your uh, people in the, that you served with in the military, or did they know about you, or how, how did you guys um, meet? Oh, um, I was contacted some years later uh, through a micro walkie-talkie in the back of my skull, and was put in touch with a former commanding officer who put me in contact with uh, my Brigadier General and then uh, that established the relationship with my Brigadier General. And yeah, I'm, that was our earliest form of communication before I got to use the psionic implant better, which accesses the hive consciousness, uh, which is like sort of a pseudo hive consciousness that USMCSS officers have. So 
we're able to communicate information and relay orders uh, telepathically, actually, which is super efficient because unless they can read everybody's minds, they're, the NSA can't tap your phones. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I've never thought about that. You definitely yeah. can stay away from Chinese servers and stuff like that. Um, it, okay. It's like being a different internet that doesn't touch the other internet. So yeah, it's, it's a completely secure form of communication and it works very well. This is a great way, great place for us to segue into what we really want to talk about because, um, because there is disclosure coming. Is that not right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. According, according to the plan, as I understand it, yes, absolutely. It's coming. But being weasels like they are, uh, they don't want to get hung, I imagine. Uh, nope. So they're going to try to figure out a weasel way to explain everything wouldn't you say yep um and not just yes, I, measles. <laughs> no uh let's uh, so i'll do my job as the pr guy and let's call it the offering of an alternative alternative narrative uh that gives the opportunity for people who would otherwise be taken out back and shot to not be and save right. their own skins so and the difficult part for me here is you know justice is important to me it's incredibly important to me i, I feel like if you do not have if you do not have a system of justice then you know what do we have um so th that's the part that bothers me the part that i have to try and reconcile with and i've had many conversations with my brigadier about this and he said look basically what he says to me is he says look you we don't get to have our cake and eat it too Right. We either get to have um, all of our principles that we insist that we're going to have in this process, or we actually get to have disclosure. He said, because what it came down to is the discussion about disclosure wasn't about any one person or any one group or any one agency saying, here's how it's going to be done. Everyone now has to obey how it's going to get done. It was a conversational process where all of these different uh, members of executive branches, legislative branches, military intelligence branches, corporate offices who would all have to be in on the discussion if there was going to be a process, everyone would have to be in agreement on what the process was so they would be able to do their job. They would be willing to take the economic hit like they're taking now because they know that the short-term loss of what they're going to lose financially will be dwarfed by the profits that they're going to make once we get to change over into the new system. So they're cool with that. But that had to be negotiated. And the negotiation process, if anyone who really understands negotiation, is not about saying, we insist that we get this this way or else. It's about saying, okay, here's what we'd like to do. How can we get everybody that we need to be in agreement that that's what we need to do to agree to it? And that's when a negotiation becomes a pain in the butt and it becomes a thing that isn't just three steps long that says we're going to do one, two, and three. It says, well, we're going to do one, two, and three, but we're also going to do these 27 different amendments, you know, lettered and numbered underneath that so that all of these participants in the process will be happy about how it's going to go for them so that they can cooperate in the process. So given that that's what we've had to do, we've had to create this alternative narrative that will get us on the same page quickly and into a future way of thinking about things quickly. And we're going to be so busy thinking about the new world that we live in that it's really going to be better for everybody if we do focus more on what's there instead of on the how we got here process because instead of complaining about how we got here we're going to actually have opportunities to trade communicate negotiate with other species as an open planet it'll no longer be you know a tight pipeline embargo that only a certain tiny number of people get to engage in the trade and conversation with it'll open up and that opening up process will, over time, I'm, I'm going to be conservative about it. I'm going to say over the next three generations, so whether the technology to keep us alive and 
uh, around or whether you and I will simply not be here and this will be the place of our children and our grandchildren, that planet will be amazing. That civilization will be absolutely fantastic and amazing. And so sometimes we just have to bite the bullet of civilization and accept that we have to go through a change to get the civilization that we want. And it's not going to be perfect for everybody because it had to be negotiated to get that way. And so there are some people who are going to get away with some things. Let's hope it's not forever. Let's, let's put, you know, the bee in the bonnet that transition allows for many opportunities. Transition of power allows for many opportunities. The wheel of karma allows for many opportunities. And I would like to believe that there is a day when um, a number of the people who think that they're going to escape justice will, you know, find it. But what's just going to be more important is we're going to be outside of the embargo of trade, of contact and consciousness, which is going to make the planet we live on so much more amazing and happy and fun and cool to live on than any of us have ever experienced before that at some point we're all just going to have to shut the fuck up and enjoy the fruits of what disclosure really has to offer instead of complaining about the long bumpy car ride that it took us to get here. So there, that's my, that's, that's my statement as a PR guy. I think we got to just put the best face on it and with the best happy face on it and say, if we truly get the things that we're supposed to get out of this, and I would suggest that if we don't get those things that, you know, that's when people can, you know, revolt and, and demand, you know, that we get the things that we didn't supposed to get. But I think we're going to get the things that we need to get, which is the ending of the trade contact and consciousness and markers. Well, I've heard the same thing. Hang on. I've heard the same thing, and um, oh, hang on. Somebody's at my door. Oh, no worries. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's a friend of my wife's or something. I'll edit that out. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, where were we? It was really good. Uh, what were you talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, the change is coming. Disclosure is coming. It's just not going to be exactly the way that we want it to have, but it's happening and we're going to get an end to the trade consciousness. And uh, oh, please go ahead. No, no, go for it. Just got to do. Secure your perimeter. What? Oh, no. Uh, I think you need to walk home. Thank you, Jay. Okay, it's cool. Somebody <laughs> looking for my old guy who's doing some work for me. All right. Oh, no worries. All right. So I know where I'm going to go now. Okay. Um, so would you say uh, that this plan that you're that's going to unfold is the this COVID virus part of the the plan? Um, that that's step one. Let's call it. Uh, there will be more steps between now and then. Uh, we will see some civil unrest. Uh, which will make us appear weak to anywhere from one to four different other nation states in the world that would be include Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And we may end up in sort of World War Three and Four style superpower conflict with one or more of them. Uh, and then when you just think it couldn't possibly get any crazier, crazier alien invasion. Yeah. And so these, uh, what kind, do we know what uh, the aliens are, which group? I would suggest that the strongest likelihood is an insectoid species. Interesting. And so they're going to invade, and so then what will happen? Are we going to get conquered? No, nope. we're going to get our butts kicked a little bit at first, and then it will give us an excuse to bring out some of the tech that we have, and we'll get to say, oh... Look at this thing we just finished developing six months ago. Not that we've had since 1973, but oh, we just happened to have this and let's try that out. And so we'll get to implement some new tools uh, almost right away, but we're gonna continue to sort of get our butts handed to us for the most part until someone else comes along and says, hey, we can totally help you out and give you some even better tech 
then we get to pretend like tech that we've had for 40 years was given to us next week by another species. Wow. And then we'll get to win. And then we get to win with their help. And then we get to have the biggest party of the millennia. So the war is just a, like a, a theater for disclosure. It gets everybody focused uh, off of each other and onto an external source, gets everybody focused on development, industrial development, gets everybody to focus on all of the things that we have to do to make civilization function, to defend it from an outside invading force, which everyone will. And then when it's all over, we'll get to celebrate and restructure and rebuild in a new dawn of new brotherhood and new prosperity. That sounds nice. Um, I've yeah, heard, it does, right? It does. And I, I've heard, uh, do you have a timeline on this? Any kind of timeline? Uh, soon. Right. Soon. Let me, put it, let me put it this way. Uh, we're already hearing uh, in the media, not just in intelligence reports, but we're already hearing people in the media talking about that they're hearing the whispers of the uh, ex sort of neo-Nazi extremists in this country who are already looking at using the pandemic as a weakness to uh, attack state or federal government. So there are some states who their state capitals, their governors and their state legislatures will be vulnerable uh, to either, a, you know, what will attempt to be a takeover and assault or mostly just probably terrorist attacks. Um, and the, there's talk that they're already thinking and planning in those terms. So we could see an attempt by any of these extremist groups to actually start off like real let's you know uh, let's go violence kind of thing anytime in the next few months i mean we really could see it anytime soon it, if it takes i let me put it this way i'd be surprised and shocked if it wasn't before the election but it could be after the election depending on Either if it doesn't go the way that those extremists want it to go and or they simply see that as then their moment of justification and vindication to, you know, finally try and push their crazy uh, right wing neo-Nazi fascist theocratic agenda, um, then they'll do it then. But I'd say it's more than likely we're going to see, you know, that sort of either isolated or some concentrated violence before the election. So that would be the first sign that it's happening. That, yeah, well, yeah, that's the next step. That's and the by, next stage. By locking everybody down, aren't we kind of uh, lighting a fuse on that stuff? I mean, people are going to start well, losing, we're, we're, losing their jobs. It's, well, let me put it this way. There was a response that could have been made by the executive and legislative branches in this country to create a social safety net that would have guaranteed that every single out of work worker or person who couldn't you know, go to their job was totally secure and you know, their rent and mortgage was paid, their family was fed, they weren't gonna fall behind on their payments um, and they could be uplifted by the social safety net for however long the duration of everyone having to stay at home would be. And I will point out that the UK, France, and Denmark basically uh, told their businesses uh, across the country, said, look, we're just keep everybody on the employment rolls and we're gonna pay 70% of everybody's salaries right now until this thing blows over. And so there are other countries that have done a far better economic response to their businesses, to their economic structure and their citizenry than we have. Well, so uh, we could have done something that was supportive of people while we were getting through a difficult process, but now it's turning into millions and millions of people filing for unemployment. Like I think we're up into the 22, 25 million 25, people, yeah. which could end up in millions of people uh -huh. being homeless if it we don't control million. rents. Oh, it, it could go, it could be almost 100 million uh, by the end of next month. All right, so yeah. what I heard from uh, one of my insiders and I'm going to do a show on this in the future because it augments what you're saying so well, which is why I wanted to do you first before I do my next insider. And he tells me that, that everything you're saying is true, but that what's going to happen is, and, and I know a lot of people aren't going to like to hear this, I actually, I know it's going to be controversial, I actually support this. There's going to be a universal basic income. It's going to be here within a year, and it's going to be universal. 
and there's no way around it. It's coming, and I support it. I think I I, I know there's a lot of people. Oh no, you have to. That's communism. Like no, I, I think it's better to have people who have food and a place to live than people who won't have food and won't have a place to live because they're going to come looking for us, the ones that have food and a place to live. So yep. it's it's a really a reasonable policy. From what I'm being told, there's no turning back. It's already done deal. And I don't know it, if, it it's, if they happen, don't, it'll happen like a year from now is what I heard. Yeah. There's if, if be a they don't of events first. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it will have to be millions of people homeless and yeah. millions of people out of work, unable to feed their families. It will have to get so bad that Republicans will finally vote for something that they have rallied against for I, decades. I got to be honest with you. I'm shocked that they voted for the bills that they did. I was floored. Uh, you, you could yeah. say that the Republicans have just started voting socialist. I'm sorry, but I mean, they did. Uh, because they realize, because they realize they have no choice. Right. They're fine. It's fine. It's the point where they're like, if we don't do this, everything will crumble. No one will make any money. That's right. We'll be absolutely screwed. So um, I would suggest that it's, it's a reasonable assumption to say that that is part of the overall plan. Yeah. Yeah. So in my, uh, so in my, if they net- don't civilization will crumble. Let me put it that way. If you uh, yes. have if you have 80 million unemployed people and millions of people who are homeless and you don't have a response of a social safety net, you will have absolute, you know, armed uprising and revolt and tearing apart of city halls across the country. And oh yeah, it would be just absolute mayhem if they let that happen. There's so much happening on so many fronts right now. Uh, the meat packing plants are all closing down. Uh, the farmers are not putting food in their fields. Um, because they can't get any workers. The food yep. processing plants are shutting down because they work real tight with each other in those places and they don't want to yep. do that. So the people aren't showing up at work. Um, uh, I don't know, man. Perfect storm. Well, then there, there are enough people rallying to get people back to certain jobs in the uh, economy, even if it's going to cost lives, that there, there are going to be some industries where people are going to be told, look, we need people to get back to work. Here's your option. You can come in for this pay. And if you get sick, you get sick. And if you, you know, we'll try to make people sure tested and we'll pay for treatments, but there will be, you know, a certain number of people that will have to return to the workforce. Yeah. Or again, you, you will affect the food supply lines, which they can impact a little bit, but you can't have the food impact supply lines really harmed for more than a few weeks right. without people really starving. And that's when shit gets bad is when people are starving. Yeah. And, and truth be told, you know, if you're 50 years and un- younger, you have a 1% chance of dying from the virus. Okay. It's boomers yeah. that are getting it. I know. Right. I Maybe mean, there are cases where the most one part. person will get it, but the ones that are dying are the boomers. And, uh, yeah. and the boomers are going to die. I know it sounds callous, but I mean, you know, they're going to die. It's just the way it goes. Death is part of life. And, but also what my insider told me is that they're going to release, uh, in this technological release that's going to happen, there's going to be, let me put it to you this way. If you can get to 2030 and still be alive, you're probably going to live several hundred years. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. There, I, I have said before, and I'll say it again, people who are my age and younger now, and even your age and younger now, and if you're going to be here for another decade, there's a good chance that you're not ever going to have to grow old and die for centuries yeah yeah that's what i've been hearing and um yep. and uh, it, it, uh fantastic what you're saying I, i'm not, i'm actually an optimist and i'm really glad to hear what oh you're yeah saying. no i'm totally optimistic about the whole thing i, I think it's going to end up working out okay um and i normally am the person who hates it when people use this aphorism but you know you want to make an omelet you got to break some eggs and it's going to be a fine omelet but eggs are going to be broken in the process you know wham wham boohoo sorry and you know honestly we, we you know they got away with the candy assassination they got away with 9-11 so you know ju- injustice has been part of our life from 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 our birth on i mean you know yeah 
Yeah, it's it's a curve, I think, as civilization. If we're really going to get to, it's going to be something that future generations are able to establish because we laid groundwork for it, not because we're going to get it, you know, this generation, because we think that we're somehow entitled to justice and fairness in the system that has been corrupt for more than centuries. Absolutely. So, and is it going to be global? I mean, are we going to be a global community, a global one country? <laughs> Well, it, let me put it this way. At some point, every successful planet that we know of out there in the universe that is successful has a centralized system, doesn't have 187 governments that are arguing with each other about trade, that are arguing with each other about laws. At some point, you have a centralized system because it's more efficient, it's uh, more economical, and to be honest, it becomes more fair. Um, because when you instigate a global system, you, everyone insists that it's accountable. Like, well, okay, if you're going to have a global system, then everyone has to be accountable. No one can ever be in poverty ever again. No one can ever be on the street ever again. So, you know, there are, we would enter into an era of civilized worlds where on other planets, there's no notion that you would let someone go hungry. There's no notion that you would let someone be homeless. Whether there are enough jobs or not, everybody has housing, everybody has food, everybody has their basic needs, because the minute that people don't have their basic needs, crime starts, crime goes up, social unrest starts, domestic violence goes up. There's all of these right social now. impacts to poverty. Yeah, there's all of these social impacts to poverty that like real interplanetary civilizations realize, look, it doesn't matter how much it costs. You just have to end poverty because ending poverty ends crime, ends like, you know, 90% of domestic violence, child abuse, uh, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction, you know, because the stress and anxiety that people have, that they're going to lose their house if they're not doing something, if they don't have enough job money, their people are, we're running on the hamster wheel in the economic system that we have. And it doesn't preclude uh, that people aren't competitive for good jobs or that people aren't you know, creative and like, no, no, I can do that job better than that guy can. There's absolutely still a competitive edge for positions of accomplishment in the structure. We, they're just evolved enough to say, wait a minute, why are you letting people starve and be homeless and not have education? Why are you not providing a social safety net that makes sure that every person on your planet is safe and okay? And so when those systems usually go into place, that's usually one of the precursors of people accepting that is when that system says, we'll make sure that every single citizen never goes hungry or homeless ever again, ever, 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 ever. And then people will be like, okay, let's do that. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke once said that the ultimate goal of technology is total unemployment, and yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that's where we're headed. I think, I think yeah. we're, I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be very many jobs. To be honest with you, uh, um, there's a ton of there's a ton of jobs that can be replaced by automation and machinery. But there are always going to be people you, jobs where you need a person to do something. Yep. So it's just going to be a lot more selective about people who want to do things, who are driven to do those things, who are creatively inspired to do those things. And people whose, you know, energies are better spent, you know, raising their families will stay at home and raise their families. I think that's exactly where we're headed. We're headed towards a, a high technology, family oriented uh, future. Uh, yeah. And um, I, I think it's a great world. And I'm very optimistic about it. And uh, I really want to thank you for bringing us good news. Oh, my pleasure. It's going to be a little rough. Uh, it's going to be a little bumpy to get there, but that's just the way it has to go. And I, let me, I didn't get a chance to really explain this because I know people yeah. always, if I don't explain it, they're going to ask. Right. So what about the other plan? What about plan A, which used to be plan A, which was the take me to your leader plan? Why can't we just have nice aliens land on the White House lawn and say, hey, we're here to be friendly. We want to share. And why can't we go from there? And why won't that work? Simple. Extremists. Because if that happened, the reaction from extremists would be hostile and violent towards anyone who is visiting from another world and anyone who supported connection or communication with visitors from another world. If we don't control the narrative by creating a villain that those people can hate and then creating a space for someone who can come along that can be the hero, 
that those people can reluctantly accept because everyone else is going to accept it, then we can, if we sure. don't control that narrative, it's chaos. It's the just hero, pure chaos. And the hero will be the person that brought us a lot of the goodies and the toys. Yep. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is actually, this is amazing because there's like a, um, there's a lot of evidence for what you're saying out there. That's all I can say. Oh, yeah. No, I, I absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As I think if people are paying attention to the ripples of what's happening, um, you know, in media representation, which is a broad spectrum of news reports that come out from different journals and websites uh, around the world, especially around the world, I find that the more um, information that I pick out of international news sources is way more you know like informative than the stuff we're getting in this country for the most part right. we get a, a lot of part we get a lot of partisanship that's either pro left pro right and yep. not much you know in the middle uh room for agreement on stuff i agree it's very polarized right now hey randy i want to thank you for coming on reality check i really appreciate it uh, my pleasure jay anytime yeah i'll definitely have you back when the sh uh when the stuff hits the fan um oh yeah <laughs> okay well thanks for watching everybody i'm jay widener this is reality check and i'll be back soon thank you